Well, the last few weeks we've been learning uh, what Paul was telling the Roman Jews, and they became believers, and he was comparing uh, Jesus to figures that they knew about it from their past experiences of being a Jew. Uh, we're going to learn a new principle this week, which I think is really neat if you think about it. But you have to understand the uh, Jewish idea of marriage. Uh, Moses allowed divorce, but God didn't. So we have laws about marriage that if a woman, if her husband dies, uh, she can't remarry without committing adultery. So there's there's a way around it, and we'll get to that in the in the script here. Okay. Paul has been comparing Jesus to Abraham and then to Adam in the past couple of chapters. He is showing what a lot of Christians think is simply doctrines of Christianity might be deeper and more complicated than they have been taught. It was easier for a pagan Gentile to understand these principles than a Jew that had been taught another way their whole life. <clears throat> the opening three verses of chapter 7 appear to be Paul paraphrasing Levitical law, one of the laws of Moses from the bib biblical Torah, about why it is acceptable to God for a widow to remarry. He will use this paraphrase as a loose illustration to make a point about what it, he means when he says that believers have died to the law. Today, even Gentiles swear to love, honor, and obey each other until death do us part. God doesn't allow divorce, but Moses introduced it to keep people from killing their spouses. There is no specific direct commandment that allows a widow to remarry other than in the case of a widow who has not given birth to a son. In that case, then the laws of Leverite marriage apply. If y'all remember back when we were talking about this in Exodus, that a person, a woman that had no sons uh, and only daughters or whatever could remarry uh, the kinsman redeemer. And we learned about that also in, in the book of Ruth. So uh, Boaz was the kins, kinsman redeemer. And this is a principle. The only way that she could ever get married again was her husband die. Well, they had to go through family too. It had to be the brother and then... Right. The and, and there was a certain pecking order. You know, a brother and then uncles and things like that. But eventually, if you saw a widow begging, it's because she had no one. That was the lowest form of life for a Jewish woman was being a widow with no son to take care of her. Mm -hmm. So she would be out in the streets begging for, for food. Okay, um, this law reflects the family requirement that when a man dies without his wife having produced a son as an heir for him, the brother of the deceased man is to marry the widow for the primary purpose of him producing a son with her. However, that son would be seen spiritually and legally as actually belonging to the deceased man. The son then allows the deceased man's bloodline to continue along with his living essence. The story can be found in the book of Ruth and is a type of, the G, type of Jesus as the kinsman redeemer. It was very important for every Jew's name to be carried on. So if you didn't have a son to carry on his inheritance, they were, that name just stopped. It was over. So uh, it's sort of like me. My, I only have one daughter. So if she doesn't marry or even if she has a son, her name will die with mine. I mean, I'm done for. So there won't be any more Evanses from this line. And so a man's son was always a big deal. And they, and they had the firstborn rules where he got a double portion and all that. They had all these rules figured out. Well, if something went wrong, it really went wrong. And it was terrible. Okay? Basically, the woman couldn't remarry unless her husband was dead to remarry another man or she was guilty of adultery and would be stoned to death. Paul is telling Jewish believers they were married to the law, and the only way they could remarry Christ was for themselves to die. Remember, this is all about the church marrying the high priest forever. All of this is about us on a wedding day in heaven. We're going to marry the high priest forever. Okay? If you are married to the law, you cannot marry Christ. 
It is of paramount importance for the believer to die to the law. Notice the law doesn't die. The believer has to die. One of the other spouses has to die. We know that Christ is alive forever, and back in Matthew 5, Christ said the law would remain until heaven and earth passed away. The only way for this to happen is if you die. Remember the spiritual language says that adultery in scriptures refer to worshiping other gods. You can follow the law or Christ, but not both. If you walk in the Spirit, you are no longer under the law because it is written on your heart. Your flesh must die to the law and sin. Uh, Leviticus 21.7 They shall not take a wife who is a harlot or a defiled woman, nor shall they take a woman divorced from her husband, for the priest is holy to God. So this is the law of priest, high priest marrying. They have to marry a virgin of their own tribe. Okay, So that's why we're virgins in the Bible. And we're we're going to be betrothed to Jesus Christ. He can't marry a harlot. You remember the, the whore of Babylon mentioned, so he's not going to marry them. Uh, a defiled woman or, the, or a divorced woman. There's a lot of people that think that uh, the Jews were divorced from God. But that's, that's not Israel. That's the Jews. Okay, For the priest is holy to God. So he is... We need to probably get this holiness down in our mind. Remember when we talked about the tabernacle, that they had to pour blood from outside the camp on the brazen altar just to get the brazen altar holy so that they could sacrifice another animal to put the blood on another holy instrument. And it was a daisy chain all the way in to the Holy of Holies. So this holiness of priest is set aside completely for God and nothing else. It is the believer who has had a change of status and not the law. By symbolically dying, we have paid the penalty that the law requires for our sins, so Paul can say that we have already died to the law. Since all humans are destined to die only once, we owe no further penalty for our sins. That's the whole idea is separating the law of sin and death from the law. We're still expected to follow the law, but we won't die if we don't. So that's the, that's the idea of dying to the law is you won't die if you sin. But he still wants us to follow the law. Romans 7, 1. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who, are, who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she was married to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law, through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were once at work in our members to bear fruit to death. So he is saying while we were under the law, we would always think about the, the illegal things to do, and it brought us death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now it's important that we talk about the spirit in the letter. Because you remember he said, the law says that if you look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery. They were thinking the letter of the law says committing adultery. Well, if I don't commit adultery, I can look all I want. He said no. So he has, he has enhanced the law. You're not out from under the law. But the thing is, is you're not under the sin, uh, the law of sin and death. There's no penalty of death. So you're still going to heaven, but you're still expected to follow the law. He said if you could, could follow the law to get to heaven, there would have been no need to send Christ. Exactly, exactly. But we have been released from the law of death. We're not going to die. Mm. Even though our flesh dies, we're instantaneously going to be with him. We must remember that sin equals death. If Christ died for my sins, then why do I keep sinning? I'm not dead yet. But my flesh is dead and buried with Christ. 
What Christ has done for us is eliminate the penalty for sin. When our flesh dies, we won't die, but live forever just as God lives forever. Christ lives forever. Paul will talk about this sin later, even though he is a believer. He's going to put out a mixed message here lately. He's saying, well, I, I know what to do, but I can't do it. And the things that I don't want to do, I'm doing. So he is caught in a quandary of, I'm not dead yet. So my body of sin is still sinning, even though I know what I should be doing. He has given us the power to overcome sin by having the Holy Spirit in us. So it's, it's no longer uh, a mandatory thing that you sin. Before you knew Christ, if, if you wanted money, you stole it. I mean, just whatever it took to get it in your pocket. And people say, well, now I was never that bad. Well, there was nothing that you wouldn't do because you didn't have the power of, of the Holy Spirit to tell you not to do it. You may have had a conscience, but you still did it. And it wasn't like you wouldn't do it. Now that we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us, we know what we should do, and our body, our sin body, should subject itself to the Holy Spirit. We should take our soul and make it subject to the Holy Spirit first. Verse 6 makes the case that a very important prophecy has been fulfilled. Does your Bible say that? No, of course it doesn't. But what is Paul is alluding to? What is Paul alluding to? He says we have been released or delivered from the law. And thus we are no longer held captive because we have died to it. Therefore, we are now able to serve God in spirit and not only in the letter of the law. Again, notice who or what died. Did the law die? No. Did we die? Yes. Thus our death has released us. Released us from what? From the need to be obedient to God's commandments? Paul has said this time and time again that this is a misunderstanding Heaven forbid. Rather, we have been released from the aspect of the law that the Old Testament sometimes call the curse of the law. The curse of the law is not an adjective that characterizes the law, and it is not the law itself. Rather, the law consists of two fundamental parts, blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. The curse of the law is death. So we are released from the ble so are we released from the blessings of the law? Of course not. If you do the right thing, you're blessed. But you're not, you're not held accountable for the curse of the law. Or as Paul says to begin Romans chapter 8, Therefore there is no longer any condemnation awaiting for those who are in union with the Messiah Yeshua. Curses, condemnation, death, these are all biblical equivalents for the divine consequences of our sins. Paul is telling us that Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33 is now fulfilled by Christ and the law is written on our hearts. If we went back to Jeremiah 31, you're going to find that he says, I will write it on your hearts. Mm -hmm. The law is still there, but it's written on our hearts instead of stone. And also we're going to talk about uh, uh, Romans 8 next week. I didn't want to get too deep into it, but this is one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible says, now there is no longer any condemnation. Well, what makes you condemned? Condemned to death. It's a jury verdict, you know. So we're not, we're not going to die. No matter how much we sin, we're going to receive grace not to die. Mm -hmm. That does not mean there's not a penalty for sin. It's just not death. Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, spoke extensively about the spirit of the law as opposed to the letter. And frankly, the spirit of the law is more demanding than the letter. For example, he says in Matthew 5, the letter of the law says not to murder. But the spirit of the law says that the divine intent of the law prohibiting murder means not to even be angry with your brother. <clears throat> and just as Jesus felt the need to pause in his famous sermon and make it clear that nothing he was saying should be taken as him suggesting that he has abolished or changed the law of Moses. Now in Romans 7, Paul pauses and feels the need to say in verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? So he's trying to explain that the law is good. It's not sin. And the law is not banned. You're supposed to follow it. Okay? He says, Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. 
He probably didn't know he was coveting things until the law told him not to covet. Then he said, ooh, I've been doing that because I didn't like what my brother got, a new car, a new house, or a better job, or a better wife, or as the Ten Commandments says, a better donkey. <laughs> Here's the thing. Does most of modern-day Christianity advocate, or at least heavily imply, I wanted to get that out there, that whether they advocate it or imply it is still there, that for believers, the law of Moses has come become sin for us. That for us to go back to the law, as it is often slanderously put, is somehow an affront to God because of what Jesus has done for us. Many of us have no doubt been asked by well-meaning believers, why would I want to go back to the law? And my response to that is, please tell me what it was like when you were living under the law. You know, the law is for believers. So if you weren't living under the law, you were lost. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I usually get a blank stare. Their inference is that non-believers, or perhaps new believers, had been living their lives under the law. The vast majority of non-believers and new believers have no idea what the law of Moses is, if it has ever been, if they've ever even heard of it. The law of Moses was only ever for the redeemed. First Israel was redeemed from Egypt, and then, a few weeks later, they received the law. The law is only for the redeemed or believers. And we usually have no knowledge of it or any awareness of its importance to us until after we are redeemed. So are we to think that God has described uh, as what God has described as goodness, life, and protection for Israel, the Torah, was actually in practice a defective covenant and ultimately a failure that merely led us to sin? So it has been replaced with a better one with more bells and whistles. Deuteronomy 30, verse 9. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand and all the fruit of your body and in the incense of your livestock, increase in your livestock and in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for, for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep His commandments and His statutes which are written in the book of the law and if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. They didn't have a, an ending date on that. We're supposed to still be following the law. And He says He'll bless you and rejoice over you for following it. Did the Lord actually put uh, pull the most cosmically monumental bait and switch operation in history upon mankind by first giving Israel the law of Moses, saying that this covenant meant blessing and life, demanding that it is obeyed, but then later retracting is all defective and a bad idea. Was this entire thing perhaps a deception or a con job? Because if God would do that, then why would I believe in the long-term efficacy of any covenant he would make? Uh, why wouldn't he offer us all this forgiveness and mercy through Christ but then one day simply decide that it wasn't working out all that well and abolish it and create something entire, else entirely. Or even more, tell us that to continue to trust in Jesus is actually foolishness, if not sin, because he's come up with an even newer and even better covenant. Okay. He wants you to know that the, the law of Moses is a covenant that's still in effect. Mm -hmm. Just like Jesus' new covenant with communion, taking communion, is a new and better law, but it's still in effect. So all of the covenants that have been made with the Jews all along, we get when we when we join the family. But they have none of them been done away with. The first covenant was with Abraham, and he said, I'll make you a father of many, na many nations and many people and all that, and give you the land. See, Abraham never got the land, but his people got the land. So all of these covenants have been passed down through the years, and we get to partake of those covenants. But because we have Jesus Christ, He hasn't done away with the Mosaic covenant. It's still there. Romans 7, 8. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And I put down here age of accountability. When was the time that you were without the law? 
before you knew any better. Okay? That's bar mitzvah for a Jew. When they turn 13, they're held responsible. If they sin after that, they can actually be put to death back in the old days before, when they killed people. But uh, that's the only time that you were out from under the law. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandments, uh, deceived me, and it killed me. And by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. He is saying that the commandments are not sin, they're not bad, they're good. Okay, We're the ones that's bad, because we can't follow the law. I think it's to convince us that we can't follow the law and we need help. Mm -hmm. But the, he gave us the commandments so that we would know what he wants and what he expects out of his people. In verse 8, Paul says that apart from the law, sin is dead. This goes along with his declaration in verse 7 that the law tells us what sin is. The point of the next three verses is to say that while on one hand the law certainly is not sin, and on the other hand it can't be denied that the law has been exploited by sin for its own wicked purposes. purposes. Then he goes on to explain something he also said earlier, that when God makes a law, our mere knowledge of the law causes our evil inclinations to kick into overdrive. If I tell you not to eat the cake, you're going to be thinking about cake all day. Okay? So what are we to think that Paul is saying about the relationship between law and, and sin? Much of Christianity says that Paul's solution to the problem then is to simply have no laws. You can't get a speeding ticket if there are no speed limits. You can't go to jail for robbing a bank if there's no law against robbing banks. So if we apply this mindset to civil society, we find that God's solution to the crime problem would be to get rid of all the laws and let the people do whatever they want. No laws, no crimes, no criminals. Easy. Frankly, what is usually pr proposed as Paul's solution is absurd. Just to get rid of all of God's, God's divine laws and sinning becomes impossible. But you hear over and over, believers have no laws. Paul then explores the reality that the same law that God meant to bring life also brings death. This fits exactly with what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 30. God means for the law to bring life and security to his worshipers, blessings. However, that only happens when one is obedient to God's laws. Disobedience to the law brings death and chaos with it, or curses. So because people still allow their evil inclinations to remain as their masters, the law of Moses causes curses upon them in a sense that there is a deadly consequence for breaking God's law. Yet as he says in verse 12, that doesn't mean that the law is defective. Rather, says Paul, so the Torah is holy, that is the commandment is holy and just and good. Let me paraphrase that. The law itself is a covenant and a justice system. It is just and it is good. So the problem that the death of Christ remedies is not to repair or repeal the Torah, which is already holy and just. The problem is solved by Christ's death, that is the divine pardon is made to available uh, for many that disobey the holy commandments of the law and thus deserves God's wrath, which amounts to curses and death. Romans seven thirteen, Has this... Uh, has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. He's just basically saying that by having the law, I got to see how, how sinful I really was. Almost everybody you talk to will say, I'm not that bad. Somebody on death row will tell you, I'm not that bad. It's funny, you know... You can talk to the average non-believer and you say, well, I'm not in jail. I'm not that bad. Mm -hmm. Everybody. I mean, well, even... That's because they look at, well, I haven't killed anybody, but they haven't looked at the spiritual side of it that if you hate your brother, you already committed murder. Exactly. And like I said, on death row, you can ask somebody on death row and they will say, I'm not that bad. It, it just got away from me or something. And they'll make excuses for what they've done. But it says, thou shalt not murder. So you need to see that you shouldn't have done it. Romans 7.14 For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Now he's separating this, the spiritual from
from the carnal. Now, he's saying that's why we keep sinning because we know the law and we know it's spiritual. We know what we should do, but my body still sins. After all of this is explored, Paul, in rabbinic fashion, has the straw man issue a ruling, which Paul will strongly disagree with. The straw man says, Then I guess from all of you, I guess from all you have said, the law that was good somehow over time became instead a source of corruption and death. To which Paul responds, Heaven forbid. Rather than the Torah remain good and pure, it is only that because my disobedience uh, to what is good clearly exposed that my behaviors were wrong and my nature was bad well beyond what I ever imagined they might be. So I finally realized that part of me as a believer and a possessor of the Holy Spirit was still bound to my slave master, my evil inclination. This is one of those theological principles that is so hard for us to hear that it's, at the same time we inherently know that it's true. It is this, as believers we are currently hanging as if suspended somewhere between Christ's death and his resurrection. That is, we have certain unity in Christ in regards to his death and burial, but the reality is that we do not share or identify in the same way with his resurrection. Until we die, we're hung in suspension between Christ's death and his resurrection. So that's why we're stuck in this sinful body. That is, Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. He arose and then, after some time on earth, ascended into heaven in a glorified body, completely free from whatever part of him represented his old nature and vulnerable flesh. You see, he never sinned, but he was flesh. And he could have sinned. He was tempted in all things. So he had to ditch his old body to get a resurrected body. Also that proves to me that I'm in the same body he had and I don't have to sin. But it's my nature to sin. So it kind of gives us something to shoot for. <laughs> we have not yet followed suit. We have not yet been resurrected into glorified bodies. We still have these same corrupt, frail bodies and so remnants of our former nature complete with evil inclinations, remain in us. We are changed, but not entirely. We are holy before God, but not every aspect of us is actually holy. We live with God's Spirit in us, yet our evil inclinations still operate and bedevil us as well. We know what sin is and how destructive it is to our relationship with God, and at times even our fellow humans. But sometimes we do it anyway. So as Paul puts it in verse 17, the real me, that is the part of me that is the new nature that the Holy Spirit has given to me, resides side by side with the old sin nature still housed inside of me. So there is a constant tug of war going on. Sometimes the new me wins and sometimes the old, men, old me prevails. Verse 15. For what, what am I doing I do not understand. For I, what I will do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. See, he's separating himself from his body. He is saying, I'm having a war with my own body. So you want to think of your flesh as something extra, something different that has to die. You have to get rid of it. That's why Peter even said, I can't wait to get off, get rid of this old tent. He called it a tent. He wants his new body. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will it is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will do, I will to do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And I always want to make this, uh, we, are, we are created in God's image, which is three persons. And we have a fleshly body, and a spirit, and a soul. So we have a new spirit, the Holy Spirit, and our body's going to die, so the soul has to be saved. It has to submit to the Holy Spirit. So, 
when you start thinking about this body as something that you're going to just change it like you would change a, a jar, you know, you got a jar here, and you want a new jar or a bigger jar, you just go get that and put yourself, who you really are, inside of it. Who we really think we are is our spirit and our soul. But we think it's coming from this, but this is just a container. This explains why we at times behave the way we do and, and have the kinds of thoughts we're glad no one else knows about. We can also be comforted by knowing that the Apostle Paul openly admits that he too is plagued by this uncomfortable duality in his own life, so we probably shouldn't feel too bad about it for ourselves. I call this condition spiritual schizophrenia. There's a lot of people that don't like this because they believe that if you once you've been saved and had the Holy Spirit living in you, you wouldn't do this. When they know that they're doing it, you know. It is partially the result of our being suspended between our own death in Jesus that has already happened and our resurrection into the new and glorified bodies which has not happened yet. Verse 21. I find then a law that evil is present present with, with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. He has no problem with the law. He delights in the law. He knows it's good, yeah. but he just can't do it. But I see another law in my members. Now he's calling his body members now. Okay, Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And I bolded out members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of the sin. So he is separating it right there. He says, I'm with God. I am going with Jesus. My soul is ready to go. I'm sold out to God. But then he gets up and sins with the same body that he had before. In verses 22 and 23, Paul speaks of his inner self versus his other parts. His inner self is his regenerated mind and it is that spiritual part of him that is therefore directly affected by God's Holy Spirit dwelling with him. And this part of him naturally loves the law and completely agrees with God's law. Let's pause for a second. Do you love God's law or do you hate God's law? And there's, there's something for us to think about because like I said, there's a lot of people that hate the law. They'll say, I'm not under the law. I'm not going to be under the law. You can't put me under the law. Jesus paid the price to get me out from under that. Well, then you're a murderer and a liar and abuse your parents and worship mm -hmm. idols. Oh no, not that. Well, then you're under the law. Okay. Do you agree with God's law or do you disagree with it? Do you seek to know and do God's law or do you seek to avoid it and keep it separate from your life? Paul uses the inner self that loves and agrees with God's law over and against other parts of his body that operate based on sin's laws. He is once again paraphrasing the standard doctrine of Judaism in the first century A.D. That is called the doctrine of two masters. God's law is one master and the sin's laws is another, an opposing master. But always with Paul it is the law of Moses that is equated to God's laws and also with a good inclination. Paul continues to make the case that the hallmark of the true believer is that God's laws are what he or she goes by and strives to be obedient to. When we fail, we are in reality being obedient to sin's laws. Now, most of y'all are old enough to remember when the Ten Commandments were on the walls and it was taught in school yeah. and all of that. Bring it used to be all of us. Yeah, it used to be good. The modern church doesn't think it's so good. And it's been removed from everything. Mm -hmm. Why would we... I think the Supreme Court said we might read it and believe it. Mm -hmm. So they removed the Ten Commandments. They don't want children to see what the Ten Commandments are. But mm -hmm. for hundreds and hundreds of years, the Ten Commandments is what a Christian lived by. It's turning around again now. I hope so. I, I hope that people are starting to find out that this uh, trying to live without God is hard. Oh, yeah. Because the laws of our land is based on the laws of God. Exactly. 
You want to say there's no God? Well, where did the laws of the land come from? Well, this is this is our our lament: is the church is changing. Everybody preaches grace. No matter what you do is covered by grace, and he is still telling you to live under the law. And they're saying, no, we're not under the law. And they'll give a verse in Romans saying, see, it says I'm not under the law. You're not under the law of death. But you're still expected to follow the law. But we don't even, most people don't even know the commandments. You know, don't even have an idea what they say. I've never ever thought that I wasn't supposed to follow the law. Well, we're old. (laughs) Thank you, Charlie. (laughs) Like I said, we remember things that other people have no clue. A 30-year-old going to church today will never hear this. They'll never hear... In fact, they'll probably say, I don't want to be under the law. My pastor says I'm not under the law yeah. and don't want to be yeah. under the law. Because then I'll die. And I'm like, no, you've been, if you've been saved, you're not going to die. If you try to get to heaven through your works of the law, you will die. Right, mm-hmm. exactly. Mm-hmm. And so what do we see in church? Adultery, people sleeping around, fornicators. Because grace covers them. They don't even try. Everybody else does it. Why can't I? You know, uh, disrespectful to parents. Don't make any graven image. Or don't worship an idol. Mm -hmm. Well, you can make money your idol. You know, everybody says, well, I'm not going to bow down to a carved stick. Well, you made money your idol. Or your job an idol. Or whatever. Exactly. Uh, Verse 24 is almost a primal scream. He's saying, who's going to deliver me from this wretched body? It comes from the righteous man who realizes his predicament. Some of his predicament has already been solved by Messiah. He has been granted righteousness and eternal life with God. See, Jesus' Jesus's blood just said, you're righteous. It was imputed to him, even though he's not righteous, just like it was imputed to Abraham and all the others. When they believed God, he imputes righteousness. So the Christ's blood has given us righteousness, even though we're not, okay? But the rest of his predicament is a work in progress, as it is for us. And there are so no easy solutions. Part of him pays attention to his evil master, part of him to his good master. But this leads him to cry out, what a wretched man I am. Many Bible commentators, ancient and modern, are deeply troubled by what they read here. Some go as far as to allege that this must be an addition by a person who can't possibly be a believer. After all, how can a Christian be miserable and have all these internal conflicts? How can a Christian so readily admit that even after being saved, there are parts of him that are still controlled by sin? Surely this cannot be a man regenerated by the work of Jesus, but to think this way, I believe, proves an allegation that I have made many times, Too often, Bible commentators begin with a settled doctrine and then work backwards from it to make the scripture fit in. (coughs) If only they would begin by reading and studying the Old Testament, if only they would see the failures of faith in some of our greatest Bible heroes, and yet how much God loved them and held them up as righteous, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and King David. All of those were failed men. Mm-hmm. But they, they were deemed righteous by God. But if you see somebody that is so convinced, well, I'm, I'm a Christian in Jesus and I'm not under sin, I don't sin. Well, you may not see it, but they've got to admit they sin in their heart. You know, there are some pretty pious people. Uh, Billy Graham. I dare you to find something he sinned about. I don't think he'd find it. But, but he would know. He would know. Mm-hmm. And he'll tell you that it's in his heart. Because if, if you're a humble man that is not trying to puff yourself up, you're going to understand that, ooh, I had a bad thought. I shouldn't have thought that. But these other people are saying, well, if you're truly, really saved by the blood of Christ, you won't act like that. Well, we shouldn't want to act like that, but we do. If these great patriarchs can fail and can have never-ending internal battles between good and evil, mm. then so can we. And the ones I mentioned didn't have the benefit of Jesus and the Holy Spirit indwelling them, as we do. I'm not sure that outside of Jesus himself there is a stronger, bolder figure than Paul. And yet he is honest enough to admit 
that while we like to speak of Jesus' finished work on the cross, in fact, His work is not yet finished inside us. And even the effects of the things He has already done have not fully taken hold. This is why we can rest easy that He will take care of it. He is the author and the finisher of the work. Now we're supposed to try to be sanctified. But at the end of your life, you will, your flesh will die and you're sanctified. He's taking care of it. This is why I urge you to listen and take to heart Paul's words in Romans when he doesn't demand that we must somehow muster up more faith from the pit of our souls no matter our circumstance. A greater or larger faith in us is not the issue. This is where I, I talk about our faith versus the faith of Jesus. We must have and maintain an unshakable trust in the perfect faithfulness of Jesus. We must determine to remain obedient to God even knowing ahead of time that we won't always be faithful. Everybody says, well, I'm faithful, I'm faithful. And I know that your faith will fall behind at some point. Mm -hmm. But Jesus has never will. Right. This is why Paul ends chapter 7 by asking the rhetorical question, who will rescue me from this body bound for death? And with great relief and thanksgiving, he answers in his own, his own question, God will rescue him through Jesus our Lord. And this is not the cry of a man who is walking the line between belief and unbelief. He's a believer, and he knows that this will come with only with the uh, blood of Jesus. Yes. This is a cry of a man who knows God and who well understands where the human race currently stands. This is a cry we should all utter when we stumble and we wonder how God could still love us after everything he has done for us. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me. Yes. It's only through Him. Mm -hmm. Don't ever think that you have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. It's only through Him. Paul sums up his present line of thought in verse 25 with a truth that represents the condition of every believer, no matter how together, how pious, <laughs> or how nearly perfect some may appear. It is that in his mind, his inner self, because he knows what he knows to be true, he has given himself over as a slave to a new master, God's law. Yet, in his sin nature, uh, that is still there, not fully conquered, the parts of him will follow sin's law, and so this righteous man will stumble, as we all do. This is why everyone stumbles. If you put your trust in a man, you're going to be disappointed. I don't care how good he is, you'll be disappointed sometime in your life. Matthew 5 verse 29 If your right eye causes you to sin pluck it out and cast it from you for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish for, than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Knowing that your body is sinful keep it away from tempting things. If you have a problem controlling your lust don't look at porn. Don't go to bars and don't look at magazines. If you have problems with alcohol, don't keep it close to you. Don't go to bars and don't hang around with friends that drink. We know that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Avoiding this confrontation is key to success in following Christ and the law. Why would you tempt your members by uh, keeping a bottle of alcohol in your truck? Well, I'm, qu I'm quitting drinking. Well, no, you haven't. You, you got it for emergency when you need it. If you have problems with women, why are you messing with porn? Why are you look, going to bars looking for drunk women and things? You have to you have to keep your members under control if you want to be a successful Christian. Next week we'll move on to chapter 8 and look at what might be the most encouraging chapter in Romans. Paul has spent the first seven chapters talking about problems with uncircumcision, judgment, and the law, our unrighteousness, and sin and failure, and chapter 8 will turn all of that around. He will tell us we have life in the Spirit. We are heirs with Christ. We will have future glory in God's everlasting love. So next week's going to be a good one. We've been reading about the law and uncircumcision and all that. And now he's going to tell us that we're heirs with Christ. And what we have to look forward to. Amen.